You'll make the introductions to it, of course. Is, yes. Yeah. Yeah, we don't have to worry about that. So we don't have to worry about. We don't have to worry about anything then. Okay. <laughs> well, Jay, uh, we're happy to have you with us today. Why don't you begin by telling us a little about uh, why and how the institution began and and your part in in that early phase. Well, that's a long story. I'll make it as short as I can. Uh, in 1947, after the World War II days, the state was very much concerned about uh, skilled craftsmen. And so the legislature attempted to establish a school for vocational training in 1945, and the uh, legislation wasn't passed. Then it was resubmitted in 1947, and it did pass. The legislature appropriated money to establish a school <clears throat> in the Salt Lake metropolitan area. And I remember <clears throat> at that particular time, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> at that particular time I was uh, a member of the State Department of Education, and Howard Gunderson was asked to go down and establish the school after the legislature passed the legislation in 1947. And he asked me if I would go down with him. <clears throat> so as, uh, <clears throat> why don't we start over and let my okay. voice clear up. <clears throat> I don't know what happened to it. <clears throat> Well, Jay, uh, why don't you begin by telling us a little bit about uh, why and, and how the institution began? Be happy to. In 1947, after I returned from the war, I was a member of the State Department of Education staff, and the legislature that year passed a bill establishing a vocational school in the Salt Lake Valley. And so President, uh, or rather Superintendent E. Allen Bateman appointed an Area Board of Control. And the Area Board of Control was consisted of seven members, and they were members of the surrounding school districts because the school districts were to play an integral part of the institution when it first started. And the board met, and they selected the name of Salt Lake Area Vocational School, and Howard Gunderson, was selected to be the president of that school and to get it started and underway in a period of seven months. I think that board was appointed in January, as I recall, and Gunderson was appointed a couple of months later, and he submitted a plan to follow the programs that would be offered, and then we started looking for a place to establish the school and we looked at uh, specifically three areas. I remember the, the uh, Veterans Administration buildings on Redwood Road were looked at, and uh, the old Troy Laundry building was looked at, and there was, was one other area, but the board elected to establish the school in the old Troy Laundry building. So immediately it was uh, put to uh, the test, and. The construction began uh, in early spring, and classes actually got underway in September of 1947. So w when you say construction began, it, <coughs> it was really remodel of the Troy Laundry building? Oh, absolutely. The Troy Laundry building had to be remodeled, and we, we built petitions, uh, I think, 12 feet high, far from the ceiling, I'll never forget uh, uh, an incident. The barbering department was right adjacent to the business school. 
and the business department mostly was girls and the barbering department mostly men and after school was underway for a while they started tossing notes over the wall to uh, line up dates and so forth meet for lunch and things like that it was quite a quite an exciting incident um, well now I understand that Howard Gunderson the first president really was only there for about a, a year once school was underway. Why did he uh, quit so suddenly? Yes, uh, Howard Gunnarsson was there a little over a year. Well, the thing that created the big halabaloo was the election of a new governor, J. Bracken Lee, who came into existence and he vetoed the appropriation of the school and so we were to operate without purse or script, I suppose. But at any rate, Mr. Gunderson had an opportunity to accept a job with the U.S. government, and he was doing work back at one of the Air Force bases. He was gone for a, a year or so. The board gave him a leave, and then after he returned, he uh, obtained a job with Kennecott Copper Corporation as a training director. Uh, he did have the idea that he would like to keep his finger on Salt Lake Area Vocational School and also work for Kennecott Copper, but the board didn't think that would be a good plan. And so they elected uh, to appoint me the acting director, and then a few months later they made me the president of the school. Did you feel like with, without an appropriation that uh, <coughs> you were in charge of a sinking ship? <laughs> a sinking ship is a good idea, I suppose. Yes, we felt like we were in charge of a sinking ship, but we had a strong dedication to the need for skilled and technical craftsmen. You know, during the war, Howard Gunderson was the chief of the war production training programs in Utah, and there were 16 of them scattered around. and. In West High School, they had a lot of equipment which was used, and so it was transferred to the school. But uh, <clears throat> uh, E. Allen Bateman was just as determined to keep the school alive as Governor J. Bracken Lee was to, to eliminate it. So they had a verbal battle over radio and in person, and finally, uh, the State Board of Education elected to keep the school alive by taking money from other two-year colleges in the state of Utah and putting it <clears throat> towards Salt Lake Area Vocational School. So we did limp along on a very skimpy budget for the first year. Did Governor Lee uh, mend his ways? Governor Lee never acquiesced. Um, the legislature, however, <clears throat> after seeing us operate on penny, pinch, pin, penny pinching budgets, <clears throat> did appropriate uh, money, uh, enough money to finish the school year. We had started to run the school knowing full well that it would terminate in March after the legislature convened if they didn't give us a deficit appropriation, and they did, which kept the school alive, and then after that we always managed to get a very meager budget from the legislature. Well, now, uh, were you involved in... in lobbying with the legislature to get that money? <clears throat> oh, you can say that again. I had a lot of good friends, though, in the legislature, particularly individuals like <clears throat> Hughes Brockbank, who at one time ran for governor, and uh, Della Loveridge, I remember, and Ezra T. Clark. <clears throat> Ezra Clark had been on the school's board of directors. Uh, as I mentioned, when we first began, a board was appointed, and it consisted of seven individuals who represented surrounding school districts. Ezra Clark was one of those. 
and he was a senator in Utah for many years, as was Hughes Brockbank. <clears throat> and in the final analysis, in the growth and development of the school, they helped <clears throat> submit legislation to purchase a new campus here. Oh, that's very nice. <clears throat> well, now, I understand that in the 50s, <clears throat> after you've been going a few years, the there was some move towards changing the name of, of the institution. Oh, yes. That was the struggle for notoriety or importance. <coughs> Everybody <coughs> seemed to think that Salt Lake Area Vocational School <coughs> was a an institution where everybody else's kids could go, but they wanted their kids to go to the University of Utah. So <clears throat> the board and this area board of control that I mentioned did operate and did a magnificent job in directing the activities of the school for 12 years. They eventually changed the name from Salt Lake Area Vocational School to Salt Lake Trade Technical Institute. And that was just the beginning of our push for dignity and prestige. I see. Well, now, I... I, I Can you hear the instructions? Where were we, Brian? Changing the name. Um, okay, well, we'll pick the part. Well, we, we've, got the, we've got the part where we talked about the everybody wanted it to go to the U and that it was the, the search for pride and integrity. Prestige. Okay. Is there anything further to say on, on the name change? Well, actually, I could go in right there that over the, over the course of 30 years, the name was changed from Salt Lake Area Vocational School to Salt Lake Trade Technical Institute. <coughs> to Utah Technical College, and since 1978, I suppose, it's been Utah or Salt Lake Community College. But it was all a, a desire for dignity and prestige, really, because Salt Lake Area Vocational School did explain very well what we were doing to begin with. <coughs> when it was Salt Lake Area Vocational School, was it intended to be strictly post high school? No. No, it was established with the idea that the high schools could send students to the school. What we found was they were sending all the less desirable and sometimes incorrigible students who couldn't succeed at anything in the high school. And so eventually we had to uh, make more stringent requirements and uh, even test the high school students who came to the school. But the school districts did have an interest in the school and it was started actually with the cooperation of the seven surrounding school districts. Uh, so <laughs> those uh, high school students who were incorrigible, some of them, uh, were, were the reason for the main change in part. Well, yes, but then we started to, uh, we wanted the dignity and, and prestige, uh, and right from the very beginning, the, the board suggested to the State Board of Education that the name be changed to Salt Lake Trade Technical Institute. But even the community, there was an editorial, I recall, in the, in the paper indicating that we shouldn't change the name because it was getting to be known as Salt Lake Area Vocational School. I remember that when it became the Salt Lake <laughs> Trade Technical Institute, that the trade tech um, abbreviation became so well known uh -huh. that when uh, the college, uh, when the institution became Utah Technical College at Salt Lake, you had great difficulty in <coughs> changing the trade tech perception. One of the greatest things we ever did to advertise the institution was develop a little brochure. 
with the letters Trade Tech on it with a little man in overalls. And those brochures were put on literally hundreds of automobiles. In fact, the parking at the old Troy Laundry Building was so sparse that uh, we had to control it some way. So after we got this to decal, we elected to make the decision. Every student who attended the institution, if they wanted to use the parking area, would have to have a trade tech decal on their automobile. And I'll never forget two riled young men from the automotive department came into my office one day, and they didn't want to put a decal on their automobile. And they said to me, what do you think this is, Russia? And I'll never forget my answer. I said, no, this is the United States of America. In Russia, you don't have any choice. Here, you have two choices. You can either put the decal on your automobile or you can park out in the street. I've never forgotten that story. <laughs> well, uh, as time went on, I understand that uh, you had a sort of a mortgage burning uh, program for the school because uh, you, you had paid up the mortgage on this building. Oh, absolutely. When the institution first started, we leased the old Troy Laundry Building with the idea that we would hopefully buy it. And uh, after, I think, four years of renting, the state of Utah elected to buy the building. Uh, I've mentioned prior to this that uh, J. Bracken Lee was very much opposed to the institution, but the legislature wanted to buy the building, which they did, but Governor Lee insisted that it be in the name of the state of Utah rather than the State Board for Vocational Education, which would be, have been the proper thing to do at that particular time. Uh, and as you uh, got established, what were the students like? You mentioned some of the, <coughs> the difficulties with some high school students, but uh, the young adults who were there, were, were they there under <coughs> sufferance or were they anxious to learn? Most of the students at uh, the school were veterans. The big percentage were veterans. There were only very few paying their own way. You may recall that after the war, the Veterans Administration made it possible for students to go to school and the government would, would pay for it. So the veterans uh, were in the majority. The high school students were pretty well kept in line by the older students who were, the, who were veterans. But if they couldn't cut the buck, then they were uh, asked to leave with the idea that they wouldn't be able to learn a trade successfully. No, the school, when it first began, had nine, uh, 17 areas of instruction. I'm talking about auto mechanics, welding, diesel mechanics, drafting, barbering, cosmetology, electricity, and we had a food service program at the beginning, and we had such programs as waitress training, which came along a, a little later. One of the interesting things about the school when it first started was we, the students went for six hours a day, and they spent the entire six hours in the drafting lab are in the auto mechanics lab, are the electricity lab. Uh, we had a radio program, which eventually evolved into a TV program. And they just went six hours a day learning how to do it by watching and instructors directing them. <clears throat> the instructors were skilled craftsmen, people who had worked in the trade for six or eight or 10 years, but they weren't necessarily teachers. And so we had quite a responsibility to assist those individuals to uh, learn how to teach and put it over. But the first few years of the institution, 
were devoted just to teaching the skill that they wanted to learn, whether it was welding or automobile mechanics. And then, after we had been going for four or five years, we did something pretty sharp, which started the development of the educational program at the school. We asked all of the instructors to go out and visit industries, garages, welding shops, radio shops, where the people were working, and we would ask the students what they wished they had have learned before or while they were at the school, and we asked their bosses, what should this, have student, this student have learned while he was at Salt Lake Area Vocational School? And we got the feedback. It was very good that they should have had some additional math. They should have had some English communications, if you will. They should have had a, a little uh, ability to write a memorandum. And so we established, as a result of that survey, we established a program called Related Training. And that, from that time forward, special teachers were obtained or employed to teach mathematics, communications, safety. And uh, from that day forward, the students would spend two hours in a theory class learning mathematics, communications, or the theory of the trade they were learning. And then they would spend four hours in the lab. And the college developed from that time uh, forward. I think the development was tremendous because the acquisition of related training was a significant improvement in the institution. And that made the, uh, the community feel much better about the school. Another thing that happened right at the very beginning was the establishment of related training programs. The apprenticeship programs started in the evening school the very first year the college was established. And we were working with apprenticeship committees from all of the crafts in the valleys. They would hold their, their meetings at the school, and we had a coordinator who helped them. The school provided the room for them to meet in, and we, our coordinator usually took the minutes for them. So they were happy to use the facilities of the school, and that made for a, a very warm relationship between labor and the trades and the college. Uh, the apprenticeship program was a most successful program, still is, always will be. That's the program where, of course, the, the people spend their time working out on the job, and then they have to go to school to acquire some related instruction, which again is drafting or blueprint reading or mathematics or communications or, or something like that. Seems to me there were over 19 uh, joint apprenticeship committees who worked with the college right on through all of the years that, of its existence. Was that a, a unique program in, uh, in institutions of this nature? Oh, I, I would say it, it's very unique. It's the thing that tied industry to the school. The day school programs were called trade preparatory programs. <clears throat> if, you <were> taking <coughs> if you were taking a trade preparatory program, you'd go six hours a day. And the school did function six hours a day. Students actually went six hours a day for maybe the first 14 or 15 years of the institution. It was only after the name was changed again from Salt Lake Trade Technical Institute to Utah Technical College at Salt Lake that uh, uh, students then started to, or the classes were sort of patterned after the, the two-year college programs in other schools in Utah. And the faculty were very anxious to have that happen naturally because they then only would have to teach five hours a day and they had an hour for preparation, which was logical. Well, that's very <coughs> interesting. Now, how, how did you decide uh, what additional programs or courses of instruction uh, that the institution would teach? I mean, gradually the, the school grew in <coughs> terms of student numbers and 
presumably you saw a need to, to expand some of those um, courses. What, uh, how, how do you determine what you're going to do? Well, as the school developed, it was very evident that we had to offer more academic training. And uh, as the school grew and we had facilities to do it, we were able to do it. It all developed from this establishment of the related training programs in which we started out teaching again mathematics, communications, drafting and blueprint reading, science perhaps, uh, the, the skill uh, or the information about the trade itself. Uh, when we were in the old Troy Laundry Building, incidentally, that developed into a tremendous campus. It was small, but an old Troy Laundry Building was really utilized to its, its fullest. And I, I will never forget that the laundry actually operated in conjunction with the school for three or four years at the very outset. We leased the building from them, but they gave us a, a rake off on the, um, on the lease if they could use a part of the facility. So they did laundry and dry cleaning there. And I might add, we learned a great lesson that uh, because the laundry was there, we learned that uh, difficult and pressing problems can be ironed out through dedication. And uh, that certainly occurred at, at the college. <clears throat> uh, as I remember stories about that campus uh, on 4th, South, and 7th East, or 6th East, I guess, um, there's a story about, the, uh, about one of the boilers blowing up. Uh, can you tell us something about that? Oh, the boiler. That was one of the most dramatic incidents that ever occurred on the 431 South 6th East campus. <clears throat> well, we heated the building by steam, and we used these tremendous boilers that the laundry had used to heat the water for their washing facilities. Every morning, our custodians would go out and light these big buildings. We had a gentleman by the name of Lou Howcroft, a large man. He must have weighed 275 pounds. Old Lou, he wobbled along, <clears throat> but he was as dependable as anyone could possibly be. And sure enough, every morning regularly, he was out lighting the boilers. Well, one morning, he got out and he lit the pilot light, <clears throat> and it went out for some reason. He had turned on the fumes. And he started to light the pilot light again, and the blasted boiler blew up. And it shattered all of the windows in the boiler room. It picked up Lou Howcroft, and it tossed him about 15 feet. It's a miracle that he wasn't injured, but oh, actually he only had a few cuts and bruises. Well, as a result of that experience, for several months, this happened in and the building was heated by those boilers and only those boilers, and we had to <clears throat> procure heaters and put them in the hall. And they were uh, run by gas, and we attempted to exhaust the fumes up through the ceiling, but the heaters were insignificant to heat the building, and uh, the smell was terrible, <clears throat> and we uh, lived with that for a number of months. Now that you've started me recalling interesting incidents, I must tell you about one more. The machine shop was located down in the basement. And uh, one year we had a tremendous storm, rain <clears throat> and snow. And I'll be dagnabbed if the sewer, li sewer line didn't clog up out in front of the building down about a half a block. And the sewer line backed up and we had about six inches of sewage, water, and real sewage on the floor of the machine shop. 
and we um, had a difficult time taking care of that. The, uh, the uh, mode of dress for the next day or two was hip boots and gas masks, <laughs> but uh, the uh, city finally unclogged the drain and everything worked out satisfactorily. Well, you, <laughs> that's a funny story. You mentioned earlier that uh, uh, the institution gradually acquired additional properties, uh, other campuses. Can you tell us about uh, those? It, it appears that I digressed a little bit when I started to tell you about the uh, uh, lease and procurement of the building. After we had leased the building, the old Troy Laundry building, for approximately three or four years, the state bought it, and as I mentioned, the governor insisted that it be bought in the name of the Board of Examiners for the state of Utah. But after that <clears throat> purchase was made, we had a, a great celebration because it appeared as though the college was going to continue to exist. And we had the Area Board of Control members up on the little stage that we had there at 4th, South, and 6th East. And we had a lot of dignitaries. We had a, a senator or two, and J.O. Jones was chairman of the uh, Area Board of Control, and other members were there. I remember we had a Senator Jensen, who lived, I think, out in Midvale. <clears throat> but we, we burned the lease. and. Uh, Somewhere along the line in the burning of the lease, some of the more ingenious faculty members had arranged to have a series of firecrackers attached to that burning. So as the lease started to burn, the firecrackers started to explode. And I'll tell you, we had some people on stage really jumping around. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was a memorable experience. Well, uh, that's great. What about uh, other campuses that you rented, uh, <clears throat> and how did that come about? In uh, about 1960, in that particular period of time, the government uh, established some programs called MDTA, which stood for Manpower Development and Training. And those were special programs which the people were recruited through the Department of Employment Security, and then we taught the classes at the college, and they may have lasted for six months or, or nine months. So uh, to, in order to operate all of those programs, it was necessary for us to acquire satellite campuses. And uh, even in 1960, I recall that we had four different satellite campuses. We had a gentleman by the name of E.H. Eisenberg, a member of the staff who had been teaching related training programs. He was asked to direct the, uh, the MDTA programs. Uh, he was given a supervisory responsibility there. And we had three programs down on the west side. And that recalls another incident that I must rela <laughs> relate. One of the uh, buildings that we acquired was very famous. In the early days of Salt Lake City, it was known as, uh, well, to be candid, I suppose I would have to say it was known as a house of ill repute. But at any rate, we established an automobile mechanics program down there and a diesel mechanics program and I remember one time a father from Vernal, Utah, called the school, and he talked to a gentleman who was a very important member of the college staff by the name of Claire Thompson. And he said to Mr. Thompson, I understand that uh, you're operating the automobile mechanics program that my son would be in down on the west side in a very undesirable location. And uh, he said, I don't know whether I want him to go there. And I thought Mr. Thompson did a very admirable, made an admirable comment when he said, well, sir, that's true, it is down there, but I, I have a lot of faith in your, your son. If he was brought up 
in the manner in which you describe that you want him to continue to live, he'll do very well here in the auto mechanics program. So we, uh, it will operate very successfully. And uh, those programs operated for a number of years before uh, they started a human resource program. And uh, then the government uh, tried to coordinate all the MDTA programs, the human resource programs. They established a program called uh, the Work Incentive Program. And that was sort of hopefully to uh, coordinate all of the other government programs. And then that led to the establishment of, of uh, the skill center, actually. And uh, that started out very small, but became a very significant portion of Utah Technical College. That began somewhere around 19, in the early part of 1970s also. Did those uh, uh, satellite campuses cause any difficulty administratively? Well, not really. Not really. Uh, the greatest problems that were created there on the satellite campuses was, was to provide the facilities, uh, making adequate restrooms and so forth. There was a, a, a bit of construction necessary. And uh, uh, no, I, I don't recall any uh, great problems that were caused by that. Uh, uh, tell us. Uh what decided you to even be looking for a new <coughs> main campus? We were always looking for growth and development. Uh, the people who were initially members of the staff at Utah Technical College, then Salt Lake Area Vocational School, were very dedicated individuals. And they had a strong commitment to the, they could see the need for the school. And the uh, Salt Lake Chamber of Commerce was very insistent and very helpful in lobbying the legislature for additional funds. Well, it, it soon became evident that the laundry building would not take care of the facilities. And uh, so we were always asking the legislature for uh, additional funds. And uh, I'm not sure, along about 1957, in that period of time, Senator Hughes Brockbank uh, and others uh, met with us and agreed to establish, uh, submit a bill to the legislature which would procure a new campus. Another bill also was submitted to that same legislature by Senator, I think it was Senator Francis Fowles. And that bill asked for $200,000 to buy strictly a campus. The Brockbank bill wanted to uh, set the school up with a special taxing unit and a special governing board. Uh, it did not pass, but the uh, other bill did pass, and then we started looking for a new campus, and it happened that the uh, committee selected the Redwood Road campus as the most desirable site. There were several other locations looked at there. I recall a, one site was up uh, beyond Foothill Boulevard on about uh, 21st or 25th South in that area. But the campus here was purchased or given the money. And after the legislature gave the money, then everybody realized that we were going to have one day a new campus and a new school. And so it, it really charged us up. But the people were so dedicated and worked so hard to uh, further the cause of vocational and technical education that. Uh, I shall never forget uh, the loyalty. Uh, we didn't have enough money in the early days of the school to paint the practical nursing department. And that was a, one of the large departments of the school. And the uh, 
the faculty and the staff decided that the facilities that the nurses had were inadequate for such a program. And as a result, we all got together on a weekend and painted the nursing department and the restrooms upstairs to make them usable. That's how dire we were during the starvation years that this institution operated. But we could always see the light at the end of the tunnel. And uh, the procurement of the campus set that off. Early, after the committee decided on this campus, and originally I think we were talking approximately about 76 acres, I think it ended up to be that we had during my administration about around 103 acres here on the campus. One of the first things that happened on this campus <clears throat> was uh, a ceremony. I remember we had uh, uh, Dr. T.H. Bell and uh, Governor uh, Clyde was there and Governor Rampton was there. The, the uh, members of the area, old area board of control were there and our, our, we set up a we set up a stage about where the administration building is now located. And closer east towards Redwood Road was an old barn. And so we elected to pull that barn down or have the student body pull it down as part of this dedication campus ceremony. And so we, uh, we invited the student body to came, come out and we had the uh, carpentry department uh, saw a few uh, boards on the old barn and then attached ropes to it and we had about 200 students out as part of the ceremony to pull the old barn down and it was really a heave ho and it came down with more dust you would have thought it was an atomic bomb <laughs> but the community certainly remembered it it was it was a great experience that was the initial ceremony that was held on this campus, on the Utah Technical College campus. That's great. Uh, what was the, the first building that went up? On the, on <clears throat> well, the first building that went up on the campus, strangely enough, was the heating plant. And that was uh, another point of encouragement because the legislature appropriated enough money to build the heating plant, and that was a commitment. And as soon after the heating plant was uh, constructed, then, of course, we had the plans approved for the administration and classroom building, which is the first building on campus to actually be utilized. There's an interesting comment about that heating plant, too. The, uh, uh, the boilers, they told us, after they were installed and the heater, heating plant was completed, uh, we were given the information that we had to heat the heating plant to keep the boilers from um, deteriorating some way the temperature had to be maintained at uh, a certain level. So we heated the heating plant for a year before we uh, had anything to heat well, with the heating plant. That's interesting. Uh, as the big move <coughs> came from the Troy Laundry building to Redwood Road. Uh, did you still keep some programs going at, at the uh, downtown campus, <clears throat> Troy Laundry? Operation Big Move. Boy, that was a great day. That happened in the spring of 1967 when we were ready to move part of the institution from the old laundry building to the Redwood Road campus. Yes, we kept a number of programs at the old campus. The nursing program stayed there. The cosmetology program was there. The barbering program was there. And we maintained uh, uh, auto body repair and painting programs there. Yes, there, there were a number of programs who remained there for two or three years. And then they were eventually transferred out here. Well, that's, that's great. 
why don't you tell us a, a little bit about the students uh, in their, their non-class time uh, when they had a chance to relax and to eat and what, what, what well, sort <coughs> of activities would go on? Well, students didn't have a lot of time to relax, particularly day school students, because they were going to school for six hours a day. However, we did have a very nice cafeteria, which developed into be a, uh, uh, naturally they had breaks in the morning, and they had a break in the afternoon, and the cafeteria was utilized where there were soft drinks machines around in the halls and, and that sort of thing. But one of the activities that, uh, well, students did participate in a, n a number of activities. I remember the fun times we used to have in assembly programs. We had an assembly program approximately once a month. And that little auditorium, if we crammed it full, we could only get maybe 370 people in the auditorium. But we had some good programs. Those programs generally were put on by the faculty. Uh, and we had some very interesting faculty members. We had a faculty member by the name of James Culligan who came from the New York area. Old Jim could tell more stories than anyone I've ever known. And the students just loved to have him entertain them. <clears throat> and I remember one time when, uh, early in the history of the school, uh, a group of us got together uh, faculty members and myself, Florence Piacitelli, and we uh, learned to do the, uh, oh, what do you call that dance? The Charleston. Oh, yes. <laughs> that, was, uh, that was a fun experience. Uh, we also had an activity which uh, was very memorable, and the students really participated in it. We called it the school carnival. And we did that for a great many years. I think we did it for 10 or 12 years until the school actually became so large that we couldn't accommodate the people who came there. Uh, the carnival was held in the auditorium and out in the halls. And each one of the departments at the school would devise some little game, whether it was throwing balls to knock down dolls or whether it was mice running around a little maze and betting on which hole they would go in. Uh, we cooked hamburgers in the hall. Uh, it was a great experience. And I think we gained, I think the students learned to love and appreciate Salt Lake Area Vocational School, Salt Lake Trade Technical Institute as a result of those activities. And of course, occasionally we had a student body dance. And they were well attended. And that. Uh, <clears throat> That developed into the establishment of alumni organizations, which uh, we promoted most of the years that, uh, of my administration. <clears throat> I remember Brian Gardner, a member of the faculty uh, who had a great many positions at, at the institution. He was the librarian, he was the director of the Alumni Association, he was the public relations man. And, and Brian had a lot of assignments and he did them all well. Well, he directed the alumni activities for a number of years. We used to have an alumni banquet. We had them at the old Troy Laundry Building. And then we had a gala celebration when we came out here to the administration building on this campus. And we would get 350 to 500 people at those activities. Uh, and then we started selecting outstanding alumni, and we would give them a plaque or a trophy. I remember uh, Bernie Tanner, who was a commercial arts student here at the college, and later was a teacher at the college. He was also a student body president I may be wrong on that, but he definitely was an alumni association president, and he did a, a terrific job. Barrett Stedman, I think, was the first alumni president. He was an auto mechanic student way back in 1950. 
Yeah. Well, you, you talked about these uh, students and the activities. Uh, how did the, um, the college center come about? <coughs> and uh, why do we call it a college center when uh, most institutions it's known as a union building? Well, that's an interesting uh, thought. I should talk about the college center. In one of the early graduation classes, and we did have graduation ceremonies each year after the school had been in operation about two years, we had a uh, gentleman on the staff by the name of Al Gaddy Anderson, who was the, uh, uh, in charge of student activities. And as is customary at high schools and universities, uh, usually the graduating classes leave some gift to the institution. And uh, the students' body officers met with Al Anderson, and they wanted to give a gift. And uh, Al suggested that they might start a fund to build a student union building or a college center. And they accepted the idea, so at graduation time, they presented the school with a sum of money, which I'm not certain of the amount, but it wasn't too significant, but for those days, it was a contribution from each student. And it seemed to me that it was something like uh, $250. From that day forward, we've always, uh, the college always collected student body or student fees. And then we started collecting fees from both the day school students and the evening school students. They paid a student fee, and those funds started building up from around maybe 1956 until we built the college center in the first part of 1972. Uh, the college center, we always dreamed that we would, we would build one because we were jealous, frankly, of the facilities that students had at other two-year colleges and universities. We didn't have those privileges in our facilities, and so it was a strong desire. We appointed at the college a, a, a committee to oversee the, the uh, building of a student center. I'm not positive of who selected the name, but I would assume that committee did. And I, uh, I, I don't recall the names of all those individuals, but I know that uh, Brian Gardner was a member of that committee, and Paul Gunderson was a member of that committee, and Burton Talmadge was a member of that committee. And there were members of the faculty whose names I unfortunately don't remember. Uh, the years have erased some of the thoughts that I had about the institution, but uh, that committee did a great job. And it was a result of their activities that we finally did acquire the, uh, the college center. One of the real frustrations about the time we thought that college center, and that was to be built with non-state funds. There is not a dollar of state money in the college center on the campus of Salt Lake Community College. It was all contributed by students. But I recall one of the shocking things that happened a year before we were to build that building. We thought we had enough money. The building was planned. The committee had done their work. And then we got the bids on the college center, and the bid was considerably more than the amount of money that we had. And I, I remember a sleepless night or two, <clears throat> wondering how we could ever bring that about. And finally, we just got together, the group of us, and said, we're going to do it. We'll do it somehow. And we did it. Uh, and that's, that's really tremendous. Um, <clears throat> If you'll allow me just to jog your memory, uh, there was some feeling against uh, titling it a union building because of our affiliation with, with unions and the apprentice uh, 
situation, and we didn't want it to be uh, thought <coughs> of as an apprenticeship type building. I think that, uh, as I recall now, there was a, a very definite reason that the college center was not named a union building. I mentioned earlier that we were affiliated with at least 19 joint apprenticeship committees, and as the college grew before 1978 when I retired from the institution, there must have been 35 different committees that we were working with. And there was a, a feeling among those union people that they didn't like the word union, consequently, uh, we decided to call it a college center rather than irritate them and call it a union building. I uh, appreciate the help. That's, your memory is great. You're younger than I am, Brian. And I, uh, Only a little. I hope you will help me a lot. Do you, is this a good time to bring? Sure. This would be a great time. <laughs>